Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the podcast, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today, our guest is Juan Benet, and this is part two of our two-part interview with Juan. So if you haven't heard part one, I would definitely recommend you go back to last week's episode, that's episode 367, to get the full conversation. Part one focused on IPFS, and part two is focusing on Filecoin. And here, Brian and Frederica went deep with Juan into the intricacies and complexities of that project. So of course, they discussed the high-level and long-term vision of the project, the technical underpinnings of how Filecoin works, the role and influence of miners on the protocol, its proximity to the Ethereum project and how it's been inspired by the Ethereum project and its structure, how it was designed and the complexities of designing systems at this scale, the Filecoin Foundation, projects and use cases being built on Filecoin, and so much more. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think Juan is such a thoughtful thinker in the space and getting an update on this project, which we had first talked about five years ago, was definitely due. What's great is to learn about the ecosystem that is forming around this technology stack. So Juan talks about an ecosystem of investors that are interested in projects that are built on Filecoin. And I'm really looking forward to the day where the Filecoin IPFS stack is a viable alternative to the Azure's and AWS's and Google's of the world for building production apps. And given how things are evolving, I don't think that that future is as far off as we think it might be. Anyway, if you're building websites today, you're probably using one of the big cloud providers. And there's a good chance you're using WordPress. I mean, it powers like 80% of the websites on the internet. I've built a lot of WordPress websites, and one of the most frustrating things has always been DevOps. Well, thankfully, the folks over at cPanel have built the WordPress toolkit for cPanel, which is a tool that makes it easy for developers to manage their WordPress infrastructure. I'll tell you a little bit more about that during the interview, but if you want to learn more right now, you can go to epicenter.rocks slash cPanel. And a couple of weeks ago, our friends over at Algorand hosted a great webinar to help developers build sophisticated DeFi apps. If you enjoyed that, you'll love their After Hours series where blockchain developers can meet with their team and community members for informal conversations about Algorand. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to algorand.com slash epicenter, but I'll tell you more later on. For now, here's our conversation with Juan Benet. Now let's talk about Filecoin. Filecoin is, is the incentive layer that kind of brings it all together. What happens under the hood? Say I am someone who wants to um, retrieve some content that I know is somewhere out there. So basically, what would happen? Whom would I pay? Who is incentivized by what? What are the crypto economics going on here? Yeah, got it. Yeah, so, so basically you're saying, hey, like let's walk through kind of like the, the life cycle of data and kind of like follow it and, and, and so on. Uh, yeah, so... Maybe let's start with, uh, I'll describe three. So first, let's add, think about adding capacity to the network, then adding storage. So, you know, a client hiring uh, hiring a miner to add some data. And then the third is a another client kind of retrieving some data that exists there. So in the first case, uh, kind of a miner that has storage to provide kind of walks up to the network and uh, pledges a certain amount of sectors. And, and a pledge is a commitment to the network that you're going to store a certain amount of, you're going to add a certain amount of capacity and you're going to produce some proofs for that capacity. And you also have to kind of, because this is related to consensus, you have to have something at stake here. You have to, there's certain conditions in which there might be certain kinds of attacks that you could play. Uh, so you, so there, that includes kind of a, a deposit of, of Filecoin. So a miner adds storage to the network, so adds some actual capacity, then gets a random seed from the network to store uh, some data and kind of or to, to produce a, a, a to kind of seal a, what is right now an empty sector storage. It's just you know capacity, uh, and this is a you know kind of a sector today is 32 gigabytes, and then you know there'll be kind of variable size sectors in the future and, and whatnot. So, you know a miner might walk in with say a terabyte or something like that. You, you divide that terabyte into you know 32 gigabyte segments, uh, and you now you know seal all of these segments and the sealing process in, in involves doing a proof of replication that you're actually 
have that capacity to provide to the network. And as a miner, you kind of have now signed up with the network to for this, this capacity. In addition, the miner kind of sets a an ask price, which is how much their storage is going to uh, go for uh, when clients kind of are going to hire that storage, uh, what it'll go for. Right now, it's, there's sort of a global ask price. So a miner, most of the use cases, miners kind of have one price and that's it. In the future, we anticipate, we, we want to have a, a flexible and fluid ask model where miners can have, can give you many different kind of prices for different tiers of storage and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but for now, sort of like a very simple one price for, for all of the storage. So at that point, kind of the miner has, you know, committed to a network to, to sort of this, and now other parties can can view it. So now along comes a user, a client, and says, okay, great, like I want to store my, uh, this data. And so the data, you know, they can just add, add it with various different kinds of tools. So they can first add it to IPFS and get a, a hash, or they can add it with a Falcon, with, with like the Lotus client, which is kind of like a, the one of the main Falcon implementations, or a bunch of other tools that that speak these protocols, like the Textile PowerGate or Slate, which is a consumer-oriented application. There's a bunch of other different kinds of things. And now that the storage has been added, you can now hire, you can now uh, kind of create a deal to hire a miner to back this, back this, back up this data. And that deal is sort of a, a relationship between a client and a, a single client and a single miner and a single piece of data. So it's kind of like the, the unit of of agreement. And as a, as a client, you probably want to do this with multiple miners because you want to replicate your data with multiple different parties. And uh, and so you now send your data over to, you know, you find these miners in the network by, you can do this a number of ways. You can either enumerate them from the blockchain, you can find them in a block explorer. There's a bunch of tools that can show you um, what miners and what ask prices they have. And so you select which miner you want, and you could be maybe price sensitive, but you might also take into account other important details about the miner. So for example, their kind of like reliability, there's a different kind of kinds of features about the miner that get tracked by the blockchain and can sort of give you a score. Right now there's there's no emergent score that you know everybody's using yet, but you could build these kind of like credit rating style uh, numbers for miners. So you, they become kind of like a very simple way of selecting miners. Uh, but you know, client right now chooses a miner and sends their data over to the source provider. Once the source provider receives it, they the deal is uh, completed and the miner publishes the deal into the network. There's a bunch of operations that happen underneath the hood uh, in order to like actually make that make that work. There's kind of some preparation of the data that has to happen in order to make it easy to prove uh, and so on. And definitely the different sizes of the data really matter, right? So if you're set, sending a little bit of data, say a few megabytes, you know, a few kilobytes or megabytes, that's going to be that kind of distribution is very different than if you're sending gigabytes or terabytes. And so, for example, in the smaller scales, that just you know, it's a very simple protocol where right away you know, kind of just send send the data over and make the deal and whatnot. As a user, you know, this is completely hidden from you. You know, the client and the miner are doing this. The software is doing this on the, under the hood, but the users themselves don't have to be exposed to all of this going on under the hood. It's kind of like a like a Bitcoin transaction or an Ethereum transaction. There's a lot going on happening under the hood for a transaction to like move to a certain place, get validated, execute, and whatnot, but all of this kind of hidden from, from the actual users. And by, by default, this is not encrypted, right, the data? That it's up to the clients to decide on the encryption structure. So, so by default, the data sort of gets pseudo-encrypted. It's not encrypted in a... In a we, we don't call that encryption because that implies a, uh, that it is hidden from the world. There's a lot of data that's public, and so you you need to allow people to to store data that that is in the clear, so that public data can be can be used. But most, you know, PowerGate and other and other tools and so on just encrypt all the data ahead of time. So you know, if you are storing an application data and so on, you encrypt it first, and then you you send it to the to the world. Think about it as like the client software gives the miner what they want the world to see, and so if you want the world to see a uh, public data set, then you, then you should give them the clear. If you want them to have a uh, an encrypted thing, you can do that. We, we've also cho- uh, thought about moving to a world where the, the data itself, anyway, is stored in model analogous to encryption. It's not exactly encryption, but it's analogous to it, and the, the data itself is dispersed and so on, and it, it's so that it's provable and, and whatnot. But uh, we, we've considered kind of doing public data sets by, by using either convergent encryption or or encryption where like the public key is like, you know, 
sorry, the encryption key is, is just zeros or something like that, but it doesn't necessarily benefit. I think it's, it becomes very useful to be very clear about where, when there's encryption and when there isn't. And so, so far, like that's, that's been the, the structure that we've, we followed because there's this important utility of being able to have these public, publicly viewable data sets. But yeah, the tooling itself, you know, defaults to, you know, if you're adding data, you know, user oriented tooling just defaults to encrypting all of it. Uh, but, but yeah, now that you've given the data to, to the miner and like they publish a deal into the network, and the miners now schedules that deal and that data to be sealed into a sector. And and uh, the ske- there's a scheduling piece here because when you hire a miner, you're hiring for them, you know, for some amount of data, and they have to pack that into a sector, and a sector has a fixed size, right? And so they kind of miners collect a bunch of pieces from a lot of parties, and then they take all of that, assemble it into a sector, and seal it all together. So you know, think of it kind of like. The mental model is think of a large storage container. So think of like a like a normal, you know, one of those shipping containers that you see on like ships and so on. And so your your stuff could be the whole container, or it could be smaller than that. And uh, or if you have bigger stuff, then it gets like partitioned off into multiple multiple storage containers. And yeah, definitely if you if you for example want to send larger amounts of data, if you want to send terabytes or petabytes, then sending it over the internet is probably a bad idea because it'll take you a very very long time. Uh, and instead of that point, you want to, if, if you are at that scale, what people end up doing is, you know, contact the miner uh, and you figure out wh- which miners you want to go for and you contact them and you initiate a deal, but you now have to ship them the data physically. And that means like you send out, send them a drive and then they get the drive. They verify that they actually got the data and they, um, they plug it in. And this is a very important piece because the you know vast amounts of data in the world are moved around this way. They're not moved around over the internet. It, it's moved entirely off the internet through physical media medium. Uh, so packaging uh, is one of the main main avenues, but many large clouds also provide the support where they'll they'll you know send you know I think like Amazon does this where they they can you can schedule a truck to come to your business and like get a bunch of drives and send them to Glacier. Right. It's like you have to fill that use case once you hit exabytes of storage and like the large amounts of data, you, you have to allow people to have this offline first oriented way of moving around data, which which is really cool because it means that you can not only move large amounts of data, but it means you can you can start moving things in, in ways that are like less expected by parties kind of trying to predictive predictively figure out all the parties that have it, it, whenever you don't rely on crossing certain borders on the internet, it's kind of like a, a really useful useful feature. Because it also means you can be, for example, partition tolerant, right? So this is isn't the case today because Falcon has one blockchain, um, and you can think of it as kind of like one single singular region. But in the future, as scalable chains arrive, and this is kind of where Falcon is headed, being able to split into different consensus regions that map to different regions of geographically, so that you can be partition tolerant, so that you can continue to make deals and serve stuff and so on, while while you're partitioned from the rest of the world, because partitions in the internet are pretty frequent. Today already, you know, if, if your data is stored in a miner and, and you can still talk to them, it doesn't matter that you can't talk to the rest of the network, you can still get your data from the miner. Um, that's an entirely off-chain oriented transaction. Yeah, so let's let's say I, I have a bunch of data and uh, I, you know, Federica is a miner and I've now shipped her, uh, you know, some big pile of data and that now, basically be you know in i mean some level the the thing you're describing right there is actually this kind of you know direct transaction or like direct connection right between me who wants to store the data and you know her who's the miner so filecoin what does it add in this scenario is it is it basically that she has to put up some collateral and then the filecoin network enforces that she actually does store it in the long run, and then also that there's this kind of like guarantee that you know other people can retrieve the data, and again she has to kind of like guarantee that level of service. Exactly. Yeah. So all what you described, and those are you know really critical components because uh, you know today people trust the big clouds because of that reputation, and and because you can trust them to continue storing your data, right? You're many smaller. Think of it kind of like the hotel and Airbnb world where before Airbnb came on, you totally could go and stay in random people's houses 
But the idea that you could like, how do you find them? How do you trust them? Where, where's the guarantee that they're, they're, you're actually going to be able to, you're actually going to have a place when you get there and people are going to receive you and you, you don't have good pictures of places or, uh, you know, how, how do you guarantee good behavior? They're like, they aren't going to, you know, steal yourself in the middle of the night or something. Uh, all of that before Airbnb was really hard to, to establish. Um, it definitely happened, right? Like there were a lot of people traveling around this way, but it was a way smaller amount of, of parties and there was a lot more risk to it. So when Airbnb came in and created a marketplace that standardized the entire flow and standardized what it meant to be on the supply side and standardized what it meant to be on the, on the demand side and built a bunch of tooling to add sort, some amount of reputation systems to it and some amount of verifiability around the pictures and, and whatnot, it just sort of cleaned up the entire market and, and, and greatly expanded its potential. Suddenly, tons of places uh, could be online, right? So if, if you have a bunch of storage and you want to kind of sell it online, how, how do you go about doing that? Similar to, you know, if you have a spare room, how do you go about selling a night in that room without a marketplace? And so that's, you know, one of the really critical components is you need a marketplace to standardize and create a protocol for how um, all of these interactions are supposed to happen. And you solve a bunch of hard problems in that kind of really add a lot of value, like, you know, the guaranteeing that the storage is going to be there in the long term. Like, that's a really critical component in any kind of storage relationship. Having a a network that's large enough to accommodate a large use, right? So if, if it was, you know, if you were kind of browsing around individual websites and, you know, you hear about somebody having, like, 10 terabytes or, like, you know, one petabyte, you're like, well, should I store my data with this this group or should I just go to Amazon? Like, that's a very simple choice. But if you insert, set ourselves sort of dealing with one large network and you can sort of expect the same kind of quality of service across it or, you know, some amount of variability between it, between it, but you have a standardized protocol for it, then you're totally able to, to trust a lot of service providers that kind of come into that, to that marketplace, right? So it's, a, it's really about kind of providing a way for the vast amount of supply out there to come together and aggregate into one marketplace that then clients can do business with. I've been building WordPress websites for over 10 years, and the most frustrating thing has always been DevOps. I'm talking about deployment, maintenance, backups, and database management. I've lost so many hours of sleep doing WordPress infrastructure management. If you've been building websites for as long as I have, you're definitely familiar with cPanel. They've been providing web hosting management software for 25 years. Well, they have a new product. It's called the WordPress Toolkit for cPanel, and I've been given an opportunity to try it out. It's really cool. It makes managing your WordPress websites really easy. You can manage multiple WordPress sites from one dashboard and you can manage users and databases too. And because all your websites are managed from a single interface, you'll be more efficient. This is really useful if you're running multiple environments like staging and production. The WordPress toolkit can also apply security settings and policies to all your sites at once so you can harden and protect your company's website. There's a free light version and a deluxe paid version that has added features like website cloning and smart updates. That's also great if you're running multiple environments. Anyway, if you're doing anything with WordPress today, I would really encourage you to check this out because it'll make your life so much easier. To learn more about the WordPress toolkit for cPanel and be informed when it comes out, go to epicenter.rocks slash cPanel. That's C-P-A-N-E-L. We'd like to thank cPanel for their support of the podcast. So the Airbnb system kind of evolved gradually, right? So basically they have a customer support hotline and if something goes wrong, you call them and basically worst case, they give you your money back and you go look for, you know, a physical hotel wherever you're stranded. So in a way, designing a decentralized network is fundamentally different in that it's kind of important to get parameters right from the get-go. And there's a lot of parameters I mean, pertaining to, you know, the, the staking and the slashing and, you know, liveness guarantees and so on. How did you go about designing those economics? Great question. So, so one part is just figuring out what mechanisms do you need. And a lot of that is thinking about the, the interactions and the flows between parties and what are the value flows that are happening, what guarantees you need to establish, think through many, many kinds of layers of, a, of potential attacks that might be possible. What are the assumptions all over the place? You want to minimize any kind of trust and make the transactions themselves verifiable. And so that mapped to things like 
producing proofs of replication so that you can you can guarantee that the storage is actually there and then map to things like an ongoing proof of space time that you where you can verify that, this, that the stuff is not only was there initially but continues to be there uh, over time and in map to mechanisms like what are the fee structures and the punishments that need to be the fees and punishments for uh, bad behavior in the network right so if a miner loses data or or things like that and one part of this was designing first you think about all these value flows you think about the mechanisms then you start thinking about what are the possible fees not only fee structures but value flow, some things have to be proportional in certain ways, some things have to be um, at least a certain amount, some things have to be markets and kind of set by various different parties together, certain things have to be estimators on network activity. So there's a, there's really a, a very large amount of, of space here and a, and a ton of parameters. The way we went about this is a large combination of, of analysis on individual mechanisms themselves and then couplings of mechanisms and, you know, and so on further. Plus, then a whole crypto economics effort to build using both simulation and, and kind of like larger scale analysis frameworks for figuring out the fee structures that would yield good results. Meaning, one part of this is thinking deeply through the problems and coming up with actual analytical expressions that tell you what the fee structure space has to be. So you figure out all the constraints between these systems, systems of, of, of components and mechanisms. And you kind of narrow down the space of possibility. So that gives you some kind of operating range. But that doesn't guarantee that it's going to work. It just kind of gives you some sense of what the constraints have to be. Uh, from there, some amount is also putting it into engineering and and development and actually running it live. So uh, we, did, we did a number of large-scale network tests with uh, many miners to figure out what kind of operating parameters were workable in a number of these things. Uh, you know, theory is one thing. Practice is something very different. Uh, and, and, you know, you learn a lot by actually putting things directly in use. But, you know, one big area of this was a large simulation endeavor that we that we undertook to figure out a, what a bunch of the different mechanism parameters have to be in order to yield yield good results. And this is kind of a, a very large effort with a, with a lot of people, uh, both uh, within and outside of PL. So this is this includes various different teams within PL, but also a number of external collaborators in uh, academic environments and and um, a really awesome group called Block Science, who's been super super helpful in building a lot of the doing some of the simulation and and analysis, and you know a number of research groups that we collaborated with for many years on different parts of the protocol, and so you end up with like a a large mechanism design space, and a bunch of parameters that you then have to make sure play nice, and this is probably one of the biggest hurdles for not just for Falcon but for the entire Web three space. It is extremely difficult to build these kinds of larger scale systems that do something more complex because the state space blows up exponentially and, and kind of like what the, what the parameter space that you have to search through really becomes very, very large. And a lot of it is you can easily end up with mechanisms that are, that are too fragile, where maybe the operating range that you have is actually quite small, but um, some other mechanism couples with it in a weird way. And it's kind of like causes this, this space to oscillate in, in a weird way and maybe kind of like actually breaks things. So, so it, Part of the part of the output is like once you do a bunch of this analysis and simulation, you end up realizing that some mechanisms actually have to change. So not only do you not only is it about parameter setting, sometimes you end up cha- having to change mechanisms to arrive at a much better, more stable construction because simulation just showed you it, both a, both either sometimes just directly in analysis or simulation shows you that this is actually like a bad system design because it is. Too, too likely to, like, you know, most of the cases that you check are, are failures or uh, it, it is, maybe it, it is not, um, it, maybe it's kind of fragile. I don't know if you're familiar with kind of like the fragility versus anti-fragility way of analyzing systems where some systems are fragile. Once you kind of push them in certain ways, they, they will tend to, and, and push them out of their sort of normal comfort zone, they'll, they'll, um, they'll tend to break. Other systems kind of respond uh, more naturally to kind of those stresses and kind of recover from those stresses better. So that that kind of lens of fragility versus anti fragility, you can you can apply to this, and and in your analysis simulation, you'll you'll be able to kind of distinguish what which mechanisms tend to be fragile and, and kind of remove them because fragile mechanisms will lead to um, attack vectors and will lead to you know they might work for now, but once somebody changes something, then you might get into a, a, a bad state. Or hey, actually, you think they work, 
but there's an embedded hidden assumption somewhere that you never expected and suddenly that actually doesn't work. So it's a highly complex endeavor to build an economy like this. Uh, I mean, I think something like the like Ethereum is similar in that when you think about it, all of the different mechanisms that are at play and the gas structure and so on. And in, in, in Ethereum's case, a lot of this kind of evolved over time and parameters were set and improved upon over many months. And that kind of scaled with usage. And even kind of like the gas model is is kind of going into a, into a, a, a major reworking with, you know, EIP, 15, I think it's 1559. And that, you know, in Ethereum's case, Ethereum was able to ship in it with a with a much smaller amount of usage and then over time scale. Uh, we weren't we unfortunately did not have that luxury like right away because we're kind of now in 2020 as opposed to in in 2015. There's a lot more attention in the in the space as a whole and in in applications like Falcon. So therefore, just from day one, we're gonna get a much larger scale of usage. So we we had to get a lot more right from the get go, which was definitely a harder larger bar, but it made it. You know, we we now ended up with a much more robust thing. I, one of the cool things is like we actually shipped shipped EIP fifteen fifty nine. Like that's the gas model that we use, uh, and it actually works really well. It just leads to certain kind of really fast base fee spikes that you know food for thought for anybody working on this area of gas modeling and so on. Really really good structure, but uh, leads to kind of like some spikes that make some people really unhappy, and it's easy to kind of run up the base fee. So we, we are getting a lot of data that I think uh, will be helpful for the Ethereum community as well. But anyway, there's, there's like a large, complex space. One of our outputs on, on this is that this is an area where uh, a lot of tools need to be made. So we had to build a bunch of internal tooling to, uh, you know, and all kinds of tools to analyze things in parts or as a whole system and kind of like simulation frameworks to be able to model this kind of economic system. And this is an area where we definitely want, want to go back to this and and think about what kind of tooling would be really broadly usable by a large number of, of groups to to really kind of you know kind of analyze in, in depth how m- most of these economic mechanisms should work, but also what what's more important than analysis I think is helping generate them. So I think this is where this this whole Web three world is at a at a juncture similar to where um, I think. Chip manufacturing was when it transitioned from kind of like human design to computer designed chips, where the constraint space got so big and and the and the the difficulty problem kind of scaled to the point where people needed to write software to do all of the chip layout and um, and solve a bunch of problems that previously you know they were they expected humans to solve, but now computers had to solve just because of the magnitude. I think we're definitely well in that space where now most crypto economies that are are going to see major usage really should be should have mechanisms that are designed and checked in great part by by programs and the tooling is just not there and does not exist for any of this and that is a huge area of of improvement that I think if we had really robust tooling we could shave months to years off of the development of every major project out there and all of the scalability improvements that are going to come in, into a lot of the projects that are out there now. So it's a kind of a really open, you know, if, if any listener out there is, is uh, interested in these kinds of topics and has been looking for a project or something like that, I think building really, really good tooling for protocol designers here is greatly needed. And that's something that we are kind of exploring as well as, as to, you know, if we were kind of doing this from scratch, what are the kinds of tools that we would have wanted to have? And what are the kinds of tools that we want for you know, future versions of Filecoin and and other protocols and, and whatnot, um, and how might we we build those? So either somebody else will go out there and build this, or or we'll have to. So ideally, somebody else will do it, and we won't have to do it because then we can just use your thing, and that would be amazing. So please do that. Otherwise, uh, we'll we'll probably end up building something here uh, at some point because there's a lot of utility to be had in in um, making it way easier to to build these systems. We, we're kind of hitting the limit of what teams of humans can do. It's just way too complex. And I think today you can probably Probably the attack space on contracts on Ethereum is so big that uh, there are probably tons of exploits at the moment that are possible because of the combinations of contracts that are not explored because we just don't have the tools to explore them. Meaning, the, the again, the combinatorial explosion is so big that humans can't be expected to figure this out. And, and so now we really need kind of systems to help us find those and close those vulnerabilities before somebody kind of builds this tooling for, for bad. 
uh, and then kind of you know exploits it. But that would still mean that basically you would have to specify the intended behavior, right? So basically, kind of like uh, in formal verification, where you kind of have to specify what you expect the business logic of the thing to be, and building tooling for how we think about expected behavior. I mean, basically, it's it's kind of like a recursive problem, no? Uh, yes and no. In that today. When people go and design protocols, they usually do it in their heads and on maybe paper and they kind of write on a notebook. And, uh, you know, then later they'll go and transcribe that into a GitHub issue and will work in some other you know, markdown document. And, uh, and you'll get a bunch of kind of paper protocol stuff. And then at some point, uh, people will, after many rounds of iteration and, and review, people will then turn that and start writing it into some implementation sometimes it's prototypes that test the validity of something before you you do any kind of like hard engineering work for the real kind of production use many times it's just you know go straight to the production use and like start building it into the main client which you know that's going to be way slow probably way slower but because you know you're going to find protocol problems in and pay the big cost of putting it into the main thing and then after all of that you know hopefully you've gone through enough rounds of analysis in the in the paper stages and if you're dealing with economics enough rounds of you know, kind of larger scale framework analysis and simulation to, to really know that the mechanisms are right. And then you're going to like put it into production and use it and then hope for the best. And, you know, and like, you know, over time kind of find problems and fix them. And that's kind of like the state of the industry. And I think that uh, most of these protocols are big enough that you have dozens to hundreds of people working on them. And maintaining the protocol space in one head is just not a thing you can do anymore. So what I'm kind of talking about is you need people to start working in software from the get-go, you need people to, when they're designing the protocol at the very beginning, you can greatly reduce the iteration cycle by doing very kind of straightforward modeling work that will kind of show that some mechanism is just not tractable or kind of won't fit with some other components or would um, w will not kind of function. So, so it is something close to formal verification or kind of like the you know, TLA plus style formal verification or something like that. But but I think it's, it's, it's got to be just dramatically easier. I think most formal verification languages and systems are way too complex for this use case. This has to be as simple as writing an expression in kind of observable or something like that, where you have a, a kind of full system designed somewhere and you are designing parts of the protocol and it's a very kind of individual researcher oriented and individual developer oriented tool that enables you to kind of add components to the protocol. But but it's not just one protocol. It's it's rather like you, you can think of a bunch of different versions, possible versions of the protocol with different kind of mechanisms. And you can test against all of these different combinations and you can think through which ones end up yielding better results. And if you can kind of couple that with simulation and kind of model checking across the, the whole thing, then you can greatly increase the speed of, of building something as complex as Ethereum and Falcon and so on. And, and I think right now, you know, kind of back in the day, the software industry faced a similar kind of transition between writing software and tests versus the entire continuous integration system that we have now. So today, you write code and you can not only write tests and unit tests for your, your part of the application and whatnot and kind of larger integration tests, but it is an industry norm that all of that is going to get tested through a very wide battery of tests across many different kind of infrastructures before it gets deployed. And, and once it passes all of these uh, performance requirements, then it will actually kind of ship, right? So if you've seen kind of the uh, dashboard, performance dashboards for Chrome or Firefox, that'll give you a sense of every single line of code gets tested across a, a really gargantuan amount of tests that test all kinds of things. And if you introduce accidentally a you know, performance hit somewhere, Everyone will know. Like you'll see, like all kinds of charts show you that this is this is going bad. And software has moved to this kind of design space and engineering space because that was a way to make the development of these kinds of large infrastructure projects so much faster, right? So something like Chrome or Firefox has hundreds of people developing on it. You can't do that in without that kind of tooling and that kind of testing infrastructure in place. So that's what I think is necessary for these protocols going forward. We need that kind of the analogous version of that kind of testing infrastructure, which is not just the software. At this point, it's really the mechanism design has to be included in it. 
because there's just way too much for individual researchers to be able to handle the the larger complexity. And and if you think that you know many Ethereum developers out there, um, and I'm saying Ethereum developers because I think this is kind of like the the kind of like largest smart contract platform out there with widest use. Um, but this probably applies to most blockchains. Many Ethereum developers out there uh, kind of approach writing a contract simply, and they just kind of you know if they're if they're they write their solidity contract, and then they think about how what exploits there might be in that one, and there's a bunch of tooling that helps you think about how to improve it, and so on, and maybe check some important cases. You know, few groups actually think through what are all the other mechanisms available to an Ethereum contract. What other Ethereum contracts are out there, and how is my contract going to get exploited by one of those out there? Right. So, it, am I accidentally creating a thing where somebody with flash loan capabilities is going to destroy the entire mechanism I just built? Or, or not, right? And hey, today is flash loans. Tomorrow it's like some other completely different thing. And so you need a you need a whole software CI/CD type version thing, but for the entire mechanism design space. Our friends over at Algorand are starting an office hours series. So every week or two, Algorand will bring together their team, partners, and community together for a live discussion intended to provide you with all the answers and resources you need towards building useful meaningful blockchain applications. By joining Office Hours, you'll learn how to get started with command line tools and use the SDK and REST APIs to help you build applications for use cases like crowdfunding, asset tokenization, supply chain management, and gaming applications. Each Office Hour will start with a theme, for example, smart contracts or writing contracts in Python, followed by an open Q&A and chat. So if you're building on a blockchain protocol that has unfeasibly high or unpredictable transaction fees and doesn't provide you the speed you need, or if you work at a large enterprise or financial institution and are interested in learning how to build applications that can integrate with your current technology stack, or whether you have no blockchain experience at all and are just looking to take the first step into learning something new, Algorand could be the right solution for you. To learn more, visit algorand.com slash epicenter for developer resources and information about their next office hours. We'd like to thank Algorand for their support of the podcast. I mean, the, the thing that, uh, like, this topic where it really struck me was that, well, there's this book called, I mean, book, it's it's kind of like a compilation of Satoshi's writing. I think it's called the Book of Satoshi. So some guy went through, you know, all of the old Bitcoin talk and, like, all of the kind of things Satoshi had written and kind of, like, organized it, compiled it, and it's really cool to read. And one of the things that really struck me when I was reading the thing was that, you know, Satoshi, as far as we know, right, he didn't anticipate like ASICs and he didn't anticipate mining pools. And, you know, Bitcoin is such a simple economic design. It, you can, can hardly make a simple economic design for like a cryptocurrency. And then even with such a simple design, it seems like there was these, you know, major unintended consequences that have kind of worked out fine. But you know, they, they seem to not have been predictable or, you know, you know, in retrospect, if we can see like, yeah, of course this was going to happen, but like, so if, and then if you think of like more complex systems, like, you know, pretty much most cryptocurrencies since then, and, you know, especially things like Filecoin, but, you know, even Ethereum, right, where you have like different pricing for opcodes. Every proof of stake thing. I, yeah, I think, I think you're totally right, right? This is such a hard problem and such an important problem to get right. And, you know, probably also you're going to have to have some, you know, some level of of ability to respond. Actually, that's the question I, I want to bring up here briefly is, oh, how does governance work in, in the Filecoin network? Yeah, great question. So maybe I'll address the kind of like a, because of the flow of the conversation, I'll address the smaller case of, you know, how do you respond to problems and then kind of from like the broader governance question. So how do you respond to problems is a really key thing for blockchains. And blockchains that don't address this directly and try to have a lot of value will not end well. In our case, the Falcon community has sort of formed a set of... So first of all, there's the, the parties running the network are... Uh, there's a lot of miners that are maintaining the, the blockchain. And we actually have a really good distribution of power. So many other blockchains are super centralized. And in our case, we have a, a much better kind of distribution overall uh, with the power than, than many other networks out there. So there's a lot more kind of miners in the, that contribute to, say, have the power or 75% of the power than in, than in a, lot of, a lot of other systems. So that's one important thing because it prevents many kinds of attacks being exploited very quickly. 
you know, there's a number of network operators that are that have a you know number of communication channels set up um, and ready for uh, for problems. And there's a number of developers, both you know, across various different organizations and companies that are pretty familiar with. You know, there, there's four implementations. There's one main one that, that most people uh, run today, but there's a few others that are joining very soon. And a lot of those developers are kind of in the weeds of a lot of this. Plus, there's a few other miners that have development shops associated with them. So there's a number of developers that those miners have as well. So it's kind of like this group of oper- network operators and this group of developers. And there's organizations that have set up on-call rotations for the operators and the developers to be able to address problems should they emerge. So if there's kind of some problem and it requires addressing very quickly, then we can figure out what the problem is as a, as a community, describe what the patch needs to be, discuss it on GitHub, whether it is fully publicly, if it's not kind of an, an exploit that's going to, if it's kind of like a natural problem or a well-known thing, or privately, if it's a, a thing where it's just kind of an exploit that's potentially wor- uh, you know, kind of exploit worthy or something like that. And then kind of arrive at what a potential patch might look like and number of people look at it and then it kind of gets agreed upon and then shipped out in a, in a release. And then that's a, a release of the code. And then at that point, kind of network operators and a number of the miners look at that release, download the code, upgrade their own set. Of, you know, if they agree with it, they, um, they download the code, upgrade, and, and kind of go from there. And there are kind of upgrades that are just software only. And then there are uh, chain upgrades. So chain upgrades require kind of a state transition. And that state transitions are slower, unfortunately, and harder. We had it as a requirement for for a space race to go through a number of really hard state transitions in very short-term cycles to kind of help bootstrap the community uh, activity around this this kind of work so that the community kind of got used to making important chain state upgrades quickly because if some major problem uh, emerges, you need the community to be able to respond to that kind of stuff fast. And kind of in the normal setting of you know, cloud infrastructure where there's one company running things or maybe two or something like that, coordination there is, can be, could be faster. You know, in, in a world with many other stakeholders, it could be slower. In our case, we think that we're responding to things as fast if not faster than, um, than other, other kind of more you know, traditionally centralized systems because we've taken on the work of, of thinking about this as a goal for the network. And many miners and developers are aligned against that problem. And we have kind of emergency response protocols that we've set up in place for, for this. Uh, you know, thankfully, we haven't had to deal with anything anything major. I mean, knock on wood and all that kind of stuff. Many, many other networks, uh, even by our age, had already kind of encountered a bunch of problems. Uh, we've had a number of important improvements and changes that need to happen quickly, but nothing kind of uh, super major. We will eventually, right? So every every blockchain goes through very large uh, kind of destabilizing hard problems. You know, Ethereum had many, there's so many blockchains that, that encounter these kinds of problems. It's just the nature of software and the nature of these, these systems. So the, the best thing is like a, a lot of preventative measures plus a lot of kind of fast response measures to be able to kind of solve the solve the problem. So it's kind of like the, how does the Falcon network as a community respond to these, these kinds of issues? And, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's been really awesome to see the, the response in general from many different groups, like individual, I'm thinking of like individual miners and individual developers in different communities that have helped find bugs or helped uh, come up with patches or submitted things and shipped releases and so on. Broader question of how does governance work? Um, that's a, we, here we borrowed a ton from Ethereum because we reviewed a lot of different systems and a lot of chains and and their approaches. I mean, we, we're super close to, in general, a lot of our community is shared with the Ethereum community. We sort of feel very tightly knit and, and, and collaborate a lot. But we sort of saw a really pragmatic feel and, and, and really kind of successful pragmatic structure to the Ethereum governance structure where you know, it's kind of RFC inspired. So you have like the normal EIPs and so on. And you have kind of like this you know strong idea of rough consensus and running code. And you have good principles set in with the community that you are going to improve things and you are going to improve implementations uh, pretty frequently and quickly, and you are going to come up with a bunch of standards and and so on. And so we kind of borrowed a lot from that. Uh, and, and so we saw it as a, a really good place to mirror a lot of like the really good good lessons. And so we, we borrowed the improvement proposal structure, which again kind of comes from Bitcoin and BitTorrent as well, and, and standard RFC style inspired 
thing. So there are five coin improvement proposals, and there's a you know anybody can submit a five coin improvement proposal. And then there's you know a set of implementations and implementers that review those proposals and kind of are in charge of deciding whether to implement them into their implementations. But that that isn't doesn't necessarily mean a decision of like they decide that an important change needs to land. It's more of that's more of a leaving it up to the community thing because you have the standard structure that happens in all blockchains where developers might say X, but if miners don't agree, then then it doesn't matter. People are gonna are gonna run something else. And so you have that natural governance structure that that emerges where you have like these two groups of parties, groups of developers and groups of miners that have to sort of it's kind of like a bicameral system where like both parties have to both groups have to agree with a change before it, it lands. So FIPS tend to be discussed a lot by miners and developers and so on. Often this starts in Slack. There's like a Falcon community Slack and people end up discussing various different avenues of, of a problem. Uh, and there's all kinds of discussion threads that happen there. Then from there, it translates into a GitHub FIP. And once it's in a FIP, uh, people will then go and discuss it there. And then from there, it'll get discussed in, we have kind of a, a weekly developer conversation that kind of goes through those FIPs and talks about which ones are slated for implementation and not and, and whatnot. And then from there, it gets scheduled into releases. And then from there, miners kind of, you know, voice, you know, by that point, if, if, if anybody, if any large group of miners and so on don't want to change that, we'll have already been voiced and it likely isn't going to get implemented because implementers are not going to start implementing something if it's not going to get accepted. And so you have like this very kind of like rough consensus and running code feel to the whole thing. It is not very formalized intentionally. And we thought that that was like a very good decision from Ethereum relative to a lot of other groups because it made it very easy for urgent things to happen quickly that are kind of like non-controversial. And and it gave the community a lot of voice for things that are important and should be taken slower. And so, so that's kind of like an important kind of mapping that we thought was useful and valuable. Now, in the long term, we do think that on-chain governance systems are really valuable and really interesting. And Falcon may end up with some on-chain governance structures in the future. The community in general is pretty interested in these kinds of things. But we haven't, we didn't want to kind of couple the, all of that risk as well into an already kind of like highly complex system. And so we'll, once some of these on-chain governance systems get more fleshed out and tested and, and work out, then the Falcon community will probably, you know, if it's valuable to adopt one, it will. There's also a foundation, uh, there's the Falcon Foundation, uh, which is taking on a lot of programs in the community um, and will help steward the long term. There's a lot of things that you need a kind of like entity uh, in the kind of normal human world to to do and, and to help steward in, in a blockchain uh, environment. And that's what the foundation is going to do long term. And so Oracle Labs is transitioning a bunch of programs over to to the foundation to to run there. The foundation is planning a bunch of other things uh, and that are really interesting and really cool and really exciting. And they as an, an entity have been kind of giving some talks lately and will likely have a much larger um, voice in, in the coming coming weeks. By the way, I highly recommend you you meet those folks. Uh, really brilliant uh, people involved with, with, um, with the foundation and a number, number of avenues. Both they have this like really stellar, amazing advisory board that has a ton of amazing people in, in uh, both in crypto and in internet civil liberties space, like a number of people from EFF. And also a, uh, you know, I highly recommend, it, Marta Belcher is like one of the main people that kind of, kind of took on building the, the Python Foundation. I highly recommend chatting with her. Uh, and then there's a number of operators that are kind of like running the, the foundation. So they'll kind of help build out a number of important programs and help steer some of the kind of development groups and committees and whatnot. But, you know, kind of a lot of the principles go back to you know, kind of rough consensus and running code and kind of like the will of what, what is like the will of the community. So you can probably expect a lot of the standard tooling that emerges with systems like this, like polling tools and and whatnot, like being able to pull miners by mining power or by um, certainly uh, token holdings are useful developers. And like one of the things that we want to do is be able to pull application developers. So if you have a bunch of application developers and hearing what they have to say is really, really key. And so we've, we've kind of sketched out some polling tools that have like these different constituencies. And so you can kind of get a sense of what people think about certain kinds of community decisions and whatnot. But, you know, it's kind of early days. A lot of it's still happening in 
Slack and GitHub and, and kind of like the normal channels, over time as, as the network gets bigger and a lot more happens with it, we'll kind of bring in a lot of the, the tooling and systems that, that other, other groups have. So you were talking about the application developers, and I think this is one of the things that I would really still like to talk about. So um, there's actually a number of projects building on top of Filecoin. Can you talk about those for a bit? Yeah, totally. And so there's a, a, a lot of different groups, and they're coming from, you know, some groups are, you know, kind of came to Filecoin from IPFS, and, and a number of them are kind of newly newly jumping into Filecoin. I'll maybe mention, so maybe say there's a kind of like set of larger developers that have kind of existing applications that are now starting to use Filecoin. Uh, and then there's a whole wave of new developers that are building on Filecoin as like they're totally new applications. And like that's also really exciting. So maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about both. So in one end of the spectrum, there's, you know, kind of uh, think of, actually there's one use case, which I think is super compelling and, and, and really important. It's one of our, you know, my favorite uh, application Applications of Filecoin uh, this is a, a an application called Starling, and Starling is a system and framework for preserving really important and valuable cultural heritage data. And so that means there are some extremely important data sets out there for that have extremely important cultural value to groups of people, where you really want to make sure that data stays around, and you want to make that verifiable. And you want you want to be able to verify that that data is being kept around. You want to verify how many that there are a lot of copies around the world that that data is not going to get lost. And you also want to verify that that data has not been tampered with over time. It's extremely critical that that data has not been tampered over time. And some of the kind of data, some of the, this kind of data is, you know, kind of important archives of documents and media and testimonials uh, of important conflicts in history. And so there's a the, the starting group uh, has been working with a number of other groups, uh, including the the Shoah Foundation and a number of other, you know, Stanford University and a number of other groups, to build out a you know an, an application that uses Filecoin to back up this incredibly culturally important cultural testimonial data that's super important and valuable. And one of the reasons that you know they they really saw Filecoin and found it really interesting and and, and really important for the use case was that verifiability. Being able to verify that the data is being kept around and who's keeping it around, and being able to verify that it hasn't been tampered with, is such a critical component in, in all of this that, uh, that 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 became kind of like an important kind of user and use case. And so that's been also extremely humbling for for me and for a number of number of us uh, working on Filecoin to see such an important use case right away for kind of a, having a significant impact uh, on the world. So we, we'll see kind of where that heads, but that's a that's a super valuable application and use case. Uh, other users are, there's a number of DAP developers that are moving around their front ends that are right now, you know, hosted on, already kind of addressed on IPFS, but backed up by uh, either themselves or or, or other or other structures uh, and are now starting to move it over to Filecoin. Uh, there's one range of applications around video that's super exciting where this is kind of coupling with, so there's a, a few uh, experiments here that, are, that I think are really, really cool. But, but I'll mention one in particular, which is a combination of Filecoin and LivePeer, where you can now kind of like drag and drop any video to this web page, and it will get moved over to the LivePeer network, get transcoded into all of the right important formats for the web, and then all of that will get put into Filecoin and then stored and distributed through Filecoin. So you have kind of like an end-to-end -end video distribution thing, you know, working with Filecoin and LivePeer you know, today. And like, that's like a super, super cool um, use case. Uh, there's people working on live video. So on one part, it's doing video distribution using IPFS and LibPDP of live video. Think of streaming, uh, streaming use case. And then take the, as the video is getting generated, once once the kind of live stream is, is over, uh, storing the whole thing uh, and, and Falcon for the long term. So then you're able to kind of view the, view the log of the, view that video stream later on. It's kind of some of the uh, video-oriented use cases that I, that I think are, are, are pretty cool. Then there's a bunch of kind of DeFi-oriented things going on where, you know, kind of the, a lot a lot of the applications that people are building right now and tools are for the whole mining community. So there's 
not only do you have applications that are using Falcon for something else, but Falcon itself requires some tools and applications built for, for its own function, kind of like with Ethereum, there's a number of, of um, applications there. So some of these include ways and structures for you know, creating better organizational structures and financial structures for mining. And so one example is you know, very standard DeFi loan-oriented stuff where you have a bridge from Falcon to Ethereum um, and then you can do a bunch of like loan oriented stuff and then back back to Falcon so miners can borrow Falcon in order to use it for collaterals. Uh, but then also um, structures where you can have contracts um, for financing the development of mining operations, right? So it turns out mining operations in the larger scales are pretty involved in endeavors. Uh, you know, if you want to maintain a bunch of really high quality storage in, in a facility and whatnot, and then you're able to kind of start creating some of the organizational structures and raise funding either by selling some of your cash flows or things like that. And this is happening in DeFi in Ethereum, right? So there's examples of this and this is groups are exploring different avenues of, for doing this in kind of a, in, in this, in this part. Another area that I don't think this is out yet, but um, uh, is a pretty interesting thing is starting to think about cloud storage itself and, and being able to sell capacity in the future as think of being able to, so, so any kind of important commodity in the world has got an important financial industry around it. So think of like being able to have oil and then have a bunch of different kinds of um, financial instruments associated with oil around it. So because we're commoditizing, because Falcon is commoditizing this digital storage on, on the cloud, people are building kind of structures where you could potentially start doing the same kind of financial instruments for cloud storage uh, on, on blockchain. So, so that, that I think will take some time to, to get going and, and kick off because it requires a bunch of exploration around what structures are needed and whatnot. But imagine having the kind of predictability that you, that you get out of other commodities, uh, but you get that in kind of the digital storage space. So that, that would be, there's that's a whole kind of like interesting world because if that's what's happening with Filecoin, then that'll push th that kind of activity about storage media to potentially happen as well. And so that's uh, a whole Falcon starting to affect the the storage media market, as you were describing earlier, um, in, in some kind of important ways. Building a bunch of different kinds of uh, systems around Falcon, there's a set of use cases there. And then there's you know a whole category of new applications that, you know, there, there's been a number of hackathons already where people are building a bunch of really cool things from games to social network. There's, there were probably like, 15 or 20 different social networks that I saw at this hackathon built uh, using Falcon, like different, you know, things like Twitter, things like um, more, more Facebook newsfeed and friends style things and messaging things and so on um, that are getting kind of experimented with. I think those things will take more time to really develop and flesh out into something that, that, that a lot of people can use, but already a, no, a lot of people are experimenting with and building these things kind of from scratch on Falcon, and that's that's super cool. And then there's a yeah, even in that class there were there were a number of people doing this kind of a live streaming work and, and video oriented work. There's another really cool one, which is this amazing use case around com machine learning computation around data. So people store data in the clear on Falcon, and then they get they have this other tooling that they can then ship uh compute. So if this Falcon miner is like equipped with this additional protocol then you can ship computation to that miner and they'll run it over the data that they have and then give you the results. And all of that is hooked up in, you know, the standard Python tooling. So you can have like your normal, you know, normal data science toolkit, and then you just import a few things in your normal flow, in like your notebook structure. And now you can both store data to Filecoin, but also kind of like ship computation to the nodes that are storing it. And so it's kind of like specific miners that are doing this. Um, because not all miners are going to be able to, you know, automatically do this. This is kind of an additional protocol that they have to run. But that's kind of like a like a, a really cool example of what's going to happen once you start adding a lot of important data that you can compute on. And data has this kind of gravity element to it, which where it's way easier to ship the computation to the data than the other way around. Like you, you want to move the computation to the data, do it there, and then kind of take the results elsewhere. So we think that this kind of compute, computing over data stored on Filecoin is, is going to be a big thing in the long term. And so we're starting to see the, the beginning versions of this and beginning use cases of people uh, experimenting with stuff. I think those protocols will probably take a while to to flesh out into something super scalable. But already, like 
you can store large amounts of data and compute with it really easily and really cheaply. Uh, and those, those are some of the cool applications um, out there. There's also just the idea of using the storage itself, right? So separate from application building, various different groups are looking at using Python data, you know, the raw data storage and, and so on. And that's pretty, I, I probably can't talk about any of the groups that I know about right now that are considering in the larger scales, but, and I think one of the important things here is any kind of major groups are going to be experimenting. The network's super new, like it just launched. The cycles for any kind of large petabyte scale usage are in the many, think of like enterprise scale, uh, time scales where they're going to be experimenting with with stuff for quite a while. And then they're going to kind of make a any kind of public uh, switch or whatever. And so we, those are going to be exciting and, and, and whatnot, but those are probably more a story for, for the future. But there's already some interesting pilots that are forming and uh, some pretty cool public data uses that that I, that's kind of like more where my heart is, where a lot of the reasons why I started IPFS in the first place were around making it way cheaper and easier to back up vast amounts of important scientific data that's open access that anybody can use and can compute with, you know, like versioning data sets and all that kind of stuff. And all of that is, you know, finally, then finally, uh, I have a, I can point to a, a network that has vast amount of capacity to back up, you know, the world's most important scientific data and kind of provide it super cheaply to, for people to use and download and, and compute with. Um, and that's really there now. So now I think like the next important milestone in that journey is, is now starting to work with a number of groups to start adding a ton of those important data sets over into, um, to Falcon. I'll mention one, one more, which I think is pretty cool. It's, uh, I'm starting to see people doing pay-per-view videos. Uh, and so you can do like video distribution. You store the video and do video distribution entirely through Filecoin. And you can do like payment channel pay-per-view stuff. And so that's also pretty cool. I mean, it's not super safe in that you know, if you get the decryption key, you can probably share it out and, and whatnot. But a lot of the times, this is more about friction than, than getting it super secure. So so that's already kind of kind of cool. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's great to see just how much there's going on and how this ecosystem is blossoming. So there's one one other topic we wanted to touch on because, you know, before the podcast, we had, we had briefly talked about it with you and, and you mentioned already this kind of two angles, that, oh, this is a blockchain scalability topic, right? And, you know, on the one hand, it would be interesting to hear kind of like your thoughts on how Filecoin is going to scale as a blockchain. But then also, you know, what are your thoughts on kind of blockchain scalability topic in general? And specifically, you know, what are your thoughts on like ETH2? And, you know, I think as we were, as we were recording this, actually, I think like today or something like that, the, the threshold, the deposit threshold for ETH2 is, has been crossed. So, you know, this is like finally now imminent that, you know, the first steps towards the, you know, the full ETH2. Yeah, so... um. Can we go back to this? I just realized that I wanted to add a, one important bit for the community on on applications. Can I add that now and then and then go back to this? One really important part of the ecosystem that's that's growing right now very strongly is this kind of whole life cycle of development of, of the hackathons and then people taking those hack, hacks and then going into accelerators and then getting of those kind of people that kind of continue on to build build businesses end up getting investments. So, so one of the really important signals in any kind of platform like this is how many developers really care about this or, or trying trying it out and experimenting with it. And then how many of those actually build, not, not just hacks, but then go on to build applications and then get investment. And then coupled with that is like how many investors in the, in the, in the space are kind of investing. Uh, so that's, that's something that I think is super cool about Falcon is it's super early right now. And already there's been a bunch of hackathons, a bunch of Groups out of that going into accelerators, and then from accelerators, there's funds forming entirely to build and invest in the Falcon ecosystem. And so they're they're now not just investors in general, but there are funds emerging that are just investing in Falcon applications. And so it's a, a really exciting and positive time for people to get involved, like people that are kind of like maybe in between things or have an application that already uses IPFS and was maybe maybe a good uh, good trajectory for for Falcon. It's a super vibrant ecosystem at the moment and it's kind of blossoming and growing a lot and there's a lot of interest from other developers and from the whole kind of development support cycle of grants and, and investments and so on happening at the moment so there's probably a bunch of projects that are getting built today and in the next few months that are going to be hitting say three to nine months from now 
So because that's usually kind of a lot of these applications take a, take a while to kind of get built out, go out there and then get users and, and so on. So a lot of the cool things that are happening at the moment uh, will probably end up uh, kind of being a whole wave of, of apps, uh, say, six, six to nine months from now. And uh, yeah, so highly encourage people to kind of get involved. And one really great area for where we hadn't really seen this happening elsewhere, but uh, our Slack turned out to be a, a uh, super active environment where I think there's you know, many, I don't know how many thousands of different people are there in different groups. And there's all kinds of um, activities around hackathons and uh, again, accelerators and, and whatnot all happening in the in the same space. And so it's a pretty active environment. It's kind of similar to the to the world of different Discord servers in, in the Ethereum community. So I highly recommend people come in and hang out and, and check it out. So the scalability question is super critical and important for the entire space. Uh, this is something that I see as the biggest hurdle to broad scale adoption in in, in Web3. So I think I, can, I kind of think, tend to think about it as the consensus bottleneck. So today there's just a ton of transactions that want to go through a, a really tiny amount of bandwidth. And most applications that consider using blockchains just run into this bottleneck and, and have to start doing all kinds of crazy um, off-chain protocols or side chains or all kinds of really contortions of their application to make it work in the blockchain model. And, and so, of course, this has you know, been a topic for discussion for a long time. A lot of people are on it. There's a lot of people trying to build much more scalable blockchain systems. And you know, I would put at the head of the pack there Ethereum and Ethereum 2. You know, the, the entire scalability uh, effort in Ethereum 2 is you know, the furthest along from, from any that I've, uh, that I've seen. And, and, um, and I think the one that's t- tackling larger questions more seriously. So I think it's a really kind of a really critical project to, to watch and, and help out and, and kind of help succeed. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome that, you know, we kind of just cross the threshold and, and uh, you know, the beacon chain is, is, is happening. And now we're going to get to to go towards the all the sharding and, and so on. I think then in the long term, though, like if you kind of like zoom out for a moment and you think about computing infrastructure in general, and you think about the kind of how much data gets generated, again, is in the order of zettabytes. How much of that is useful to store probably right now in the you know, tens to hundreds of exabytes? That's, again, growing exponentially. Of that, you know, some fraction of it is application data that requires really fast, uh, com- basically consistency times, where people are used to chatting on a on an app, typing something, pressing enter, getting to the other person, and getting persisted into long term storage, and never losing that. And they're used to kind of operations on social network websites that you know they click a bunch of buttons, and all of that gets persisted somewhere. Building an application platform that can support that kind of a scale of use is not only non-trivial, but will require solving a bunch of challenges for, for Web3. So in some cases, you can segment some of the operations to be client-side only. And, and if you can do that, that's, that's great. But there's a lot of operation that has to be whole network oriented. And when you hit any kind of real usage, you're going to run against this limit, this kind of consensus oriented limit. And sure, you can try to do a bunch of stuff off chain, but you end up having now two problems because a whole part of your application has to live on a blockchain. And then there's another part of the application that's on the client side and kind of a user interface. And there's another part of the application that has to live somewhere in between some other off chain protocol that's custom. And that I think is like not the way to go at all. I think that for Web3 to succeed in the long term in general, we have to hit a system that can hit millions of transactions per second and can get pretty good consistency. And by that, I mean, you know, sub-second style commits where somebody can like type a thing, press enter and close the application, like, you know, in, in kind of human scale, like within seconds and know that all of that was stored safely somewhere. And someone's going to be, the other user is going to be able to get that and see that. And the application is going to remember their settings and whatnot. And doing that for billions of users in a crypto native sort of way is going to require that we have this like consistency structure built in, right? So for applications where it's really just between an individual and a group of people, that's where things like there's like these things called textile threads, which are part of the textile stack in 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 the IPFS and Falcon ecosystems, where 
you can sort of model a lot of your updates into your application and you, you, into kind of like a thread of operations. So think of us having a chat stream or us sharing some documents with each other, having kind of like a, a Google Doc style experience and modeling all of those changes in that kind of thread and shipping all those updates to each other and to kind of some uh, to Falcon to store and back up in the long term and us being able to kind of pull that out of there and kind of use it. And so, so there's a bunch of applications where that will work. But that kind of consistency is does not require super hard, rigorous kind of network intermediation, right? So we can do it like a Google Docs style thing. If we if we have a protocol that kind of can see the updates and I can see my updates, you can see your updates, we can both sign them. And all we need is the log of operations to reconstruct the whole thing. That's easy and that's kind of, you don't have to build a custom off chain thing for that. You can use textile threads and, and be done. And so that you can now model in, think of kind of like, a normal web developer experience uh, without kind of thinking of any complex Web3 crypto stuff and have some very simple primitives and very simple data model that just works for developers and they don't have to think about it a lot. And like that's you know kind of working now. But as soon as you have something where you need some kind of important business logic that users can't change and it requires some kind of like network operation, that's where, where you have to now suddenly put this into a blockchain or into a network of other off blockchain, but important validator type roles. And I think that's that's what I think in the future is going to be entirely blockchains. It just has to be scalable systems. And and again, I, I really think that that kind of, there, there is so much need for that kind of a transactional model that we're going to need to build systems that can scale to millions of transactions per second and clear very quickly. And I think that the way that we're going to get there is by building consensus systems that can shard over time as they get used in certain regions of the world, but where they're really mapped, they're not kind of just generic shards across, right now I think like the, the Ethereum 2 shards are going to be, you know, I think like 1,024 shards or something like that, or maybe 2,000 something, I don't remember what the last number is, uh, but they're all going to be the same and they're all going to be global. And I really think that if people start modeling these shards as being related to regions, you can do a couple things. One is you can speed up the, the consensus time because it means you can you can go way faster in one region. So doing consensus in one continent is way faster than around the whole planet. Uh, it's a speed of light issue, right? Like the Earth is pretty big, so like you gotta wait a certain amount of time for propagation of the uh, of information. If you reduce the size and say you create a region in a part of the world, then that looks pretty different. And you can keep subdividing this, right? So if there's a lot of usage in one region, you can keep going down into a city scale, or you can go all the way down into kind of a data center scale. And of course, your security maps to that, right? So definitely in the smaller scales, you're going to be at higher risk, but you're you're stamping your way up and into kind of the consensus hierarchy. I think that's one, one important component. And this geographical split also gives you partition tolerance, right? So you can imagine one country or one continent losing access to the rest of the internet. And so maybe suddenly all they can't see or observe all transactions outside of their sphere, but you can still get consistent transactions within that continent or that country or that city. So I think that, that uh, blockchain systems have to move into that into that realm. Uh, the other component that I think is, is really key here is to start sharding in an application-oriented way. So one of the really key things about computing in, in history has been being able to recognize that a lot of the access patterns to data and computation, use case-oriented or a specific kind of where a lot of the kind of the reason rights for an application or important transactions happen, if you start modeling your system to match the application you use, you get a bunch of performance gains. So I sort of expect that we'll end up having application-specific shards or application domain and industry-specific shards that have different parameter tweaks for those use cases. So certain use cases don't require super hard consistency right away. They are fine with eventual consistency. And there are other use cases where Consistency is super critical, but they don't have to move as fast. And so being able to tune your selection there and being able to be on, on, on a on a chart that operates one way versus another, it's kind of like a really, really um, key piece here. And I think like the way that this is going to end up playing out is that eventually we're going to split up the consensus protocol part, like linearizability, from all of the smart contract part. And we're going to build one layer that's just around getting linearizability in this very kind of hierarchical generic way that's super scalable. And then we're going to build systems that can do the 
interpretation of what got linearized and the computation of what that output is as a second layer. And so I think like that's already started to happen with Ethereum. Right? So the beacon chain is one important step in that direction. You have you know, one important hierarchy split there where one of the, the main, the, the beacon chain is just around maintaining like the, the global uh, consensus security and not necessarily doing the computation in the shards. But I think it has to go like, I think this is going to end up getting separated out where many different protocols are going to be homed in one consensus layer. We just haven't figured out what that has to be. Nobody really knows the parameter space yet that is going to succeed there. But I, I just think right now, blockchain systems are dramatically way too complicated and they're not going to stand the test of time this way. I think they're going to split. Uh, I think they're going to have layers of them ripped up in the same way that when you think about the TCP IP stack, TCP and IP are, first of all, two different protocols that together are helped by a whole protocol soup, you know, alphabet soup type set of other protocols, many of whom like have changed a lot over, over time and in, in history. And a lot, there's a lot of flows that don't even use TCP anymore, use Quick and other kinds of systems. And even when you look at IP itself, it has emerged, changed a lot and has all kinds of like in-between layer, layer things. So I think taking another path of the entire blockchain system with an IETF style view of decomposition of protocols and really getting at the core problem and building one protocol that solves one problem extremely well, and that's it, is what's going to lead to the things that are going to stand you know, many decades and that are going to give us the scalability we need. So like, those are like kind of my thoughts on where the blockchain scalability can go. But uh, yeah, happy to like dig into any of, any of those pieces further. Yeah, I mean, then thanks so much for joining us, uh, Juan. It was like, uh, you know, so awesome to like catch up and like have this, you know, just the complexity and the richness of everything happening around Filecoin and, and Protocol Collapse is amazing. And yeah, I think, you know, we're just at the beginning right now with the blockchain being live for a few months and, you know, people building new applications. So yeah, we're super excited to see how this is going to play out and kind of the impact it's going to have in the coming years. So thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a, a really awesome uh, to get to chat about all, all of these topics with you. Really enjoy talking about all these different areas. So, so really appreciate the chance to, chance to do it. And yeah, really, really fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.